Good morning. Well, in light of the fact that uh, Pastor Mike is not going to be here for the chili contest, what we can do... Yeah. (laughs) What I was going to say is that what we can do, we can do an early voting and we can fix it, right? (laughs) Yeah. Bunch of you can, yeah, bunch of you can hold on to your ballots just in case you didn't get enough. You know, just make sure it is postmarked right. We can, we accept hand postmarked as well. So, no problem. So, as Pastor Mike said, today we are going to be looking at the Church of Philadelphia and complete that section. Now, as you know, uh, we have been talking about the Church of Philadelphia. It's a little church, and uh, they probably were in this particular area where only maybe a few home churches, and they were kind of tiny. They really didn't have a whole lot of power, but boy, were they effective. And in fact, out of these seven churches, Church of Philadelphia is the one that that really gets the crown in terms of praise from the Lord. You know, there are two churches that the Lord doesn't have anything negative to say, one being the Church of Smyrna, and the other one being the Church of Philadelphia. It's strange that both of them were actually being persecuted. Uh, Does that say something? Yeah, I think it does, you know. When we get to the Church of Laodicea, we find out. And uh, so in this church, as we have been talking about, uh, we went through all of these churches. It's really strange to see how close these churches are. Right? They are all in about maybe 40, 50 miles from one another, and maybe 60 or 70 between, let's say, Ephesus and Laodicea. But you see how each one of them have turned out in a different way, because this evaluation really tells us what happens with the churches over a period of time. The same thing can happen with us individually because these letters are not only written to these historical churches that existed back there in 95 AD when the Apostle Paul, who was exiled on the island of Patmos when the Lord appeared to him to write this letter, but it applies even to us today, and it applies to each one of us as well. You see that, for instance, Church of Smyrna was a very heavily persecuted church. So was Philadelphia. But you get to the Church of Laodicea, they are very comfortable living. Looks like there is hardly any persecution there. You get to the church that is in Sardis, the Lord referred to them as a church that is dead. And Sardis, they had a name. They weren't very effective at that point. Looks like there wasn't much persecution against that church. So it just kind of reminds you of what's going on in today's America, right? You can be in one state, that they are enforcing the law, and things are okay. You go another state across the border, and they are not, and everything is messed up, right? So the more things change, the more they remain the same. So the letter is written to the church as well as to the angels, and we said that the responsibility of this angel is that, that he is keeping a record for the heavenly a court, if you will. And uh, each one of us have an angel. Each church has an angel that's looking. Each city seems to be have an angel. Each country seems to be an angel that you're keeping record of it. Because when the Bible talks about that the books are going to be opened up, it has all the records of what has happened in history. It has the record of what has been going on throughout the ages. So we have the church angel that it is recording this for the church of Philadelphia. As I said, the Lord has nothing uh, negative to say about this, so I'm going to read, if you can follow me, Revelation chapter 3, and I'm going to read verses 7 through 13. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. This is their missionary work. Awesome, awesome. I know your work. See, I have set before you an open door. No one can shut it, for you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, 
I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet, feet and to know that I have loved you because you have kept my command to persevere. I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go at no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes then out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So last week, we covered, I think, until the end of the verse 8, and today we're going to start with verse 9. Verse 9, it says, indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan. That's strange that this is exactly the same thing that the Lord told to the church in Smyrna. And let me tell you, today we may not have necessarily a congregation of Jews, or we don't have Jews that persecute the church today, though there is part of them that do. But there are other synagogues of Satan. And they manifest themselves in a different ways, right? It could be Islam. It could be secular humanists. It could be higher educations that they go after the church because they just cannot tolerate to hear about the Lord Jesus Christ. You can talk about God all you want. As long as it is generic, it's fine. The minute you talk about the lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ, as, as the minute you talk about that he is the way, the truth, and the life, then everything all of a sudden is off the table, right? All rules, gone, all rules of civility is no longer in play. So he says, uh, the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not but lie, indeed I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. That is referring to that there are going to be these very people that are persecuting this church, that are going to be converted. When he's talking about that they're going to come and worship at you before your feet, it's not talking about they're going to come and worship you. It's talking about that they're going to come and worship with you. So this is talking about their effectiveness in ministry and conversion. We're going to come back to this verse again. But for the time being, I want to look at, you look at something. Let's look at verse 10. Like I said, we're going to come back to verse 9. Verse 10, it says this. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Now, if you all familiar with the concept of rapture, this is talking about the rapture, right? We're going to talk about it in a minute. But I want you to notice something. The way that this reads, if you read verse 10, it says, because you have kept my command to persevere, comma, I will also keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world. That sounds like a condition, doesn't it? In other words, it makes it sound like that you're going to be kept from the hour of trial if you persevere. But we know that's not the case, right? I mean, we know that everything that comes from God, when it comes in terms of his grace, is not contingent upon what we do or we do not do. It's a free gift, right? So this has led to a theory which is referred to as partial rapturism. Now, what is a partial rapturism? Well, they say, well, here is the idea. The idea is that, you know, if the time whenever the rapture takes place, if you are not persevering, if you are in some sort of a sin, if you are in some sort of a situation, right, you're not going to get raptured. You're going to be left behind. And so then what's going to happen? You're going to go through tribulation, 
And then as you go through tribulation, you're going to learn your lesson. As you become good and holy, then God will rapture you. Well, there is a couple of problems with that. Number one, like we said, the grace of God is not contingent on the things that we do or we don't do. So if that would be the case, then this is negating the grace of God because rapture is a gift from the hand of the Lord to his body, right? Number two, this actually goes in the face of a few scriptures that we have. You notice in 1 Thessalonians, and we're going to come back to 1 Thessalonians later on, but for the moment, I want you to see what Paul is actually writing. He says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain. Do you see here, Paul, saying that some of us that are alive and remain? No, there is no distinction, right? He says there are two groups of Christians at that point of time when the Lord comes back. Those who have been believers and have died, and those who are believers and are alive. So there is no partial group of Christian. And then he goes on, he says that we who are remaining until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep, meaning that we are not going to precede those who are are dead. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So those who are dead, who have died, who have been believers, They're going to rise out of the grave first. And then he goes on, we who are alive and remain. See, twice he says that we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. So Paul, when he's writing this, he doesn't have any partial rapturism in mind. It is for everybody, right? Then there is this other verse, 2 Corinthians 5, 9, and 10. We have talked about this. This is talking about the Bema seat, judgment seat of Christ. He says, we make it our own aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account. Well, if partial rapturism is correct, then Bema seats means nothing. Because they all have already been perfected. Why do they need to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Are you with me on that? So partial rapturism is not accurate. Now, I want to show you a few things. This is a copy of a Dead Sea Scroll. This is written in uh, Hebrew. And if you look at here, you don't see any punctuations. You don't see any numbering. You don't see a chapter. You don't see any commas. You don't see anything like that, right? This is a Greek manuscript of the New Testament. The same thing here. You don't see any of those punctuations and all that. And punctuation, hyphenation, makes a lot of difference to the meaning, right? Look at this. It says, I'm sorry I love you. (laughs) Right? That would be a grounds for divorce. Right <laughs> Now, you put a comma there, I'm sorry, I love you. That is a grounds for a romantic dinner, right? <laughs> so punctuation makes a lot of difference, right? So while I was doing some research on these things, I came across the uh, commentary, commentary on the book of Revelation by Dr. Andy Woods. He's the president of the Schaefer Theological Seminary, and uh, he's talking about uh, Dr. John Nimola. Dr. John Nimola is his colleague. He's a Greek scholar. So in this particular journal of the uh, Schaefer Theological Seminary, Dr. Nimola makes this statement. He makes the statement of that here are some things that are not part of the original Greek manuscripts. Chapter divisions, verse divisions, punctuation marks like periods or commas, or exclamation points. 
Then Dr. Nimelov goes on and talks about the Greek structure and talks about that how in Greek, and I do not speak Greek, so I do not know. I'm just relying on Dr. Woods. So he said, how when you are writing in Greek, actually you cannot start a sentence with a cause, that the cause will always come after the sentence itself. So Dr. Nimola writes, Greek sentences rarely begin a sentence with the phrase because you have when explaining, explaining the cause or reason for something as Greek and English texts of Revelation 3.10 unfortunately do today. Instead, because phrase, phraseology consistently follows later in the sentence. Are you with me on that? Now, what does that mean with what we are talking about? So now let's look at verses 9 and 10 again. So verses 9 and 10 should read this way. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you because you have kept my command to persevere, period. You see, so now that because you have kept my command to persevere goes with the previous sentence and not with the following sentence. Now that is going to make the following sentence to be an unconditional promise from the Lord to his church. Now, last time we looked at this chart. The reason I'm showing this chart, because I want you to know how these people were so successful in their ministry. How they affected the culture around them. They were little, they had no power. This got to give us a lot of encouragement because the Church of Jesus Christ is alive and well today. We serve a living God. We serve the one who controls everything by the power of his word. We serve the one that controls the universe. He controlled the universe when he was in his mother's womb. He controlled the universe when he was on the cross of Calvary. That is the living God that we serve. So it really doesn't matter all the challenges that we are facing in our nation, and there are a lot of challenges. The point is, is the church faithful to the Lord. Because if we are faithful to him, God will do through church mighty works that defies the logic of man. So when we showed this chart last week, we said that everything that's going on in our culture today, all the discussions, is all the way at the top. It is on politics, right? That is what everybody's talking about. Nobody wants to talk about, you know, what is right and wrong about the politics they are talking about. They don't want to know what the truth is underneath of it or what the nature of reality is, right? So how did the church in Philadelphia handle it so we can use it as a model? Well, the Lord started by telling them, he who is holy, he who is totally different. He who is not the same as any human being. In other words, we start by belief in the Creator. They start at the top. They start talking about the politics. We do not. We do start with them talking about politics, but we're going to have to push that down to its level if somebody is going to be converted to Christianity. So we start by making a distinction who the creator is versus who the creature is. Now, that is something that's in us. In other words, you get involved with somebody talking about whatever the issue is, uh, be it Black Lives Matter, be it critical race theory. You start up there, but you're going to have to know in your own heart 
that what really distinguishes us from them is because we believe in a creator that is different than the creature, that there is a distinction between the two, and try to bring that conversation further down. Then the Lord tells them, he who is true. Once we have that in our own heart, that who the creator is, then our belief is that all truth comes from him. Truth is not relevant. Truth is not my truth, your truth, something personal. Truth is something that the creator has established. And now we know that in our own hearts, we know who the creator is, and we know the truth that he has given us. Then we can judge what is right and what is wrong. We can go to him and, talk and find that in our own hearts we know that, and we can carry this in our conversation. And God has placed everybody in a different location, and a different place, and a different surrounding, and different sphere of influence. Somebody may be in a sports, Somebody may be in business. Somebody may be in politics. Somebody may be in whatever else. We are all different. So you can be talking about the law. You can be talking about history. You can be talking about events of life in general. And you can follow this by sanctifying. That's what the Bible refers to, sanctifying Christ in our own hearts. What does that mean, sanctifying? It means setting them apart. He is not just another guy. He is not just a good prophet. He wasn't just a good man. He was the creator that came into this universe to show us who the creator is like. And then, once we have done that, right, what is right and wrong that comes from the truth that we have, that comes from the fact that we know who our creator is, then we go to the politics, and we discuss that. So that is the model that the Church of Philadelphia had, and that's how they were successful in their ministry. That is how they were able to convert so many people in their own area that the Lord brought to them. See, the work. As it says, the battle belongs to the Lord, folks. The battle doesn't belong to us. What belongs to us is faithfulness to our God. And God, he says, because you are faithful, I am going to make those who are of the synagogue of Satan to come and bow down at your feet to worship me alongside with you. How do you think that the Muslims are being converted in Islamic countries? Because the Christians are being faithful even to the point of death. That is big something to them. When the Muslim gives his life, you know 9-11? What happened on 9-11? You had all these guys. These guys had no hope in their heart that they are going to heaven. In fact, there is no way of salvation is in Islam, right? Because ultimately, it is that how much good you have, how much bad you have. If your bad is less than your good, you are okay in their theology. Apart from the fact that nobody has any goods, no one is righteous, right? But here is what it says in their hadith, that if you die for the cause of Allah, that all your sins are forgiven. So what did these guys do? The night before that they flew the planes into the towers, you know where they went? To the Gogo Club. Because if you're gonna die and all of your sins are gonna be forgiven, what the heck, might as well enjoy this life to the end because all of it is gonna be forgiven the next day. You see how bankrupt that thought is? But that's not so with us. We have a savior that has given us his life, that he says, my 
blood washes your sin. And you talk to Muslims, they say, well, I don't need anybody to die for me. I'm perfectly okay. It's not only just that. Catholicism teaches the same thing, right? You've got to do good things in order for you to be saved from your situation and your sins. Now, somebody says, well, why is it important that Jesus sheds his own life, his own blood? Well, let me tell you, it is just as important as God told Noah to build the ark. Noah had never seen a flood. For all that matter, he had never seen rain. God says, I'm going to send a flood. So what would Noah do if God didn't tell him how to build the ark? Right? Only God knows what kind of a storm he's going to send and what kind of a boat he needs to have to endure that kind of a storm. That's how it is with the Lord Jesus Christ. Only God knows what kind of a redemption is required to wash away our sin. Everything else is just man's opinion. Now, lest you think this is something trivial, let me read you something. This was just in the news on uh, September 6th, just a couple of weeks ago. Brazil's Leonardo R. H. Steiner, made cardinal last week by Pope Francis, and he has insisted that homosexual acts are only sinful for Christians, and thus gay unions should be approved. So, what is he saying? He's saying, look, he's up here. He says, you know we are talking about homosexual sin, that is only if you believe homosexuality is sin for you. If you don't, you're okay, right? What has he done? Now he's no longer going down here to see why it's right and what's wrong. He's no longer going down that who it is that is speaking against that. Then he goes on and the report says, using the logic of not wanting to impose conventional morale on non-Christian, Colonel Steiner told LifeSide News that the church should not try to make society follow its beliefs, right? That means what? Don't witness. You don't have to worry about it. But that's precisely what the church is supposed to do, isn't it? The church is supposed to talk, and we are supposed to be the salt and the light and be applied to the culture and society that people would be saved. Then he goes on, he says, this is not about a fundamentally moral, moral question, right? He said, this is about a life. This is a question about a son of God. Now what's he talking about? He's talking about that there is a universal brotherhood of mankind. But is that what the Lord Jesus said? He said, no. There are two families. There are the families of God, and there are the families of Satan. Yes, we are all members of the human race, but not everybody is the same. So this cardinal, which is at the highest level of the Catholic Church, is saying that basically everybody is a son of God. So you don't have to worry about how they live. Let them alone, and which we do. You know, truth of the matter, homosexual, when it comes to homosexuality, I really don't care how anybody fornicates. It's between them and their God. It's not up to me. But when it comes to the issue of the church, is that acceptable? No. That is just fornication like any other fornication it is. So do we reject homosexual? Of course not. We embrace them because they are sinners like us. Their form of sin is just different. So the church is open. In fact, 
the church in Corinth, when you read about Corinthians, you see that they had some of these issues going on in their own church. Paul didn't say throw them out. He focused on the fact that who they were and how they have been washed by the blood of the Lamb. He focuses them on who they are internally so they can live their life externally. So now, we're going back to this verse 10. It says, I will also keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Now, this verse, verse 10, is one of the most hotly debated verses in the Bible. Every phrase, every one of those words that you see has been debated. What does it mean will keep you? What does it mean from? What does it mean the hour of trial? What does it mean the whole world? What does it mean test? What does it mean those who dwell on the earth? Every one of those is hotly debated and hotly discussed, right? So we don't have time to go through all of those, but I just want to point out a couple of them things for you. First of all, the idea of rapture was introduced by the Lord Jesus Christ at his uh, dialogue with his disciples at what is known as upper room discourse. This happens the night before he was crucified. And uh, by this time, by the timing of this verse, in verse 1 of chapter 14, Judas Iscariot is gone. So he's only talking now to believers. Okay? He has already told them that he's going to go away. And they are troubled. They are stressed. He has been their protector, provider. He has been their shield for the three and a half years or however long that they were with him. The thought of him going away is very problematic for them. Now, this is the night where he's going to be led. He's going to go to Garden of Gethsemane. Then he's going to be led to the Calvary. He's going to be crucified. So this is a very agonizing night for the Lord Jesus. But look what he's doing. Instead of focusing on himself, he's focusing on his disciples. Right? He's focusing them on what he is going to be doing, who his father is, and look to the future. Now, I know, I've talked to a bunch of you, I know that some of us are upset that Mike is going away, rightfully so, after 33 years, right? I told them, I'm really happy for him, but I'm sad for me, right? But our focus, folks, going to have to remain on the Lord Jesus Christ, who he is. We're going to have to focus on who the Father is. We're going to have to pray for one another, pray for Mike, and him has promised to pray for us. Or did I just make it? <laughs> so here it was the Lord Jesus is telling them. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and watch this ver- uh, phrase, receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. So the Lord Jesus Christ, in the upper room discourse, he basically gave the seed form of all the doctrines that later on is going to be expanded by Apostle Paul, that's going to be expanded by Peter and other disciples. So the seed of all of those were done in upper room discourse, right? So taking off of that, Apostle Paul writes, again, going back to the verse that we just looked at. What was going on in Thessalonica? In Thessalonica, these guys were kind of Church of Smyrna. They were under severe persecution. 
Who was it that was persecuting them? The Jews. They were stirring up the government, basically. Right? They had influence. They were stirring up the government. Government was coming out. You can read about it in the book of Acts, what happened in uh, uh, Thessalonica, and what happened in church when the Apostle Paul established church in Ephesus. So now, they are really upset because they are under this severe persecution on one side. Some of the believers have died. And somebody is coming and telling them that, you know, you guys missed it. You are alive, you missed it. Those guys are gone, and you are in the great tribulation because of all this stuff that's happening to you. Now, their heart is all stirred up. So Paul is coming to comfort them about what's happening. So he tells them, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Did you know that as a believer, when when a a brother, sister dies, that we don't mourn like they do? You know, I had one time uh, a convert in the Iranian church had told me, he said, you know, one of the things that was amazing to me, and she had been here in the United States for a number of uh, years. She said, every time that I went to a Christian uh, funeral, they were all singing. Well, you gotta see a Muslim funeral. I mean, you're talking about dirge. They wail, they cry, they beat themselves because they have no hope. (coughs) So Paul here, we don't go through the same thing as those who do not have hope. We don't sorrow like them because our hope is not in this world. Our hope is where the Lord Jesus Christ is. He has risen from the dead. Do we know anybody else that has risen from the dead? Did Muhammad? Did Buddha? Did Vishnu? None of them did, right? We have a risen Savior. So he says, I don't want you to mourn like them. Because if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, now this is different than the second coming. There is gonna have to be a distinction that's gonna have to happen in your mind, and we're gonna talk about it in a minute. There is a distinction between the rapture and the second coming. Rapture is when the Lord Jesus Christ comes for his church. Second coming is that when the Lord Jesus Christ comes with his church. So, he says that the Lord is going to bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this I say to you by the word of the Lord, this is not my opinion, this is what the Lord has said, right? That we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Now, notice what he said. We who are alive, he included himself in it. You see, there is this doctrine called doctrine of eminency. Doctrine of eminency means that we expect the Lord Jesus Christ to come back at any moment. That's where it comes from. See, here it is, the first century. Apostle Paul expected that the Lord Jesus would come back in his lifetime. And you say, well, wait a minute. 2,000 years he hasn't come yet. Yes, he hasn't but we expect him any time for him to come. He could come before this sermon is over. When is he gonna come? When the last person that is designated to become a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ becomes a believer, then the rapture will happen. That's what Romans chapter 11 tells us, right? So it's very important, the doctrine of eminency. We're gonna talk that about it in a minute as well. It says, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the death in Christ will rise first. And that is why he is going to bring with him those who have fallen asleep, because the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we 
who are alive and remain shall be caught up together. And this whole word caught up together is the word that we get the rapture from. It's a, uh, basically, uh, it's not the Greek, but it is Latin word of it that they have gotten the word rapture from. In the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. You see, there is a comfort in that. What's the comfort about? Well, there is going to be a seven years of a great tribulation that's coming upon this earth. That is a very awful time. You cannot go through the seven years of tribulation and comfort yourself. You're going to be suffering a lot. You're going to see Antichrist eyeball to eyeball. And you're going to go through all the problem and agonies and everything that's happening. Comfort one another with these words. Don't work that way, right? And then you see this is Paul's letter from the same First Thessalonians. I want you to notice one thing. It says, they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. You know, just as a side note, you see what it says? That they turned to God from idols. So when somebody is going to become a believer, there is going to have to be a turning away before it is a turning to. That is why it is so important for us to have established who the Creator is. That is so important before we tell about the Lord, people about the Jesus, that who the Lord Jesus Christ is, that who is the one who has created the world. So the ones that you are worshiping now, now is an idol. Turn away from that and turn to God. Turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says that, and how you turn to God from idols to serve a living and true God, and to wait for his son from heaven. This is the first church, right, in Thessalonica. This is the first century. What is he telling them? To wait. See, that eminency we just talked about? These people were instructed to wait for the Lord Jesus to come because they were expecting them, they were expecting him to come in their life, lifetime. Whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. And this is a very crucial point, that he's going to deliver us from the wrath to come. Some people see that. They say, oh, well, wrath to come. That means I'm going to go to heaven. I'm not going to go to hell. That is not the wrath this is talking about. Because that wrath was dealt with when you became a believer. At the time when you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have gone past from darkness into light. He has delivered us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. So that wrath is already gone. So what wrath is this? This is talking about God's wrath coming upon mankind. This is talking about the great tribulation. So he's comforting them. He says, you are not in the great tribulation, as they were taught, because they were disturbed by some people that had written him a letter or had given him some words that they are now in the great tribulation. Now, getting back to Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. I'm going to read it after the period. I also keep you from the hour of trial. So some say, okay, this from means that we are going to be in the tribulation, but God is going to protect us, kind of like the way God protected the Jews when they were in Egypt. You remember when they were in Egypt, what happened? There was a time that the plagues that came upon the Egyptians, but none happened on the Jews. But that's not what he's talking about. This word from means the definition of it. A primary preposition denoting origin, 
the point where action or motion proceeds, meaning from, out of, literal or figurative. That is how it is used in Matthew chapter 7, verse 3 and 5. It says, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the plank from your eye and look at the plank that is in your own eye? So in other words, when he's talking about this, when he, the idea of removing something from is that you take it away from the environment that it is in. So when we talk about the rapture, when he talks about that he's going to keep us from doesn't mean that we are going to be in the world. That means we are going to be removed out of this world. Now, here is a different belief in rapture. We believe the very first one, pre-tribulation. We believe that there is a seven year of tribulation that's going to come upon this earth. If you read the book of Revelation, you may remember, we talked about it, that the Lord Jesus appeared to Apostle John. He told them to write the things that he has seen. That was the glorified Christ. And the things which are, that is the section we are in, the seven churches that are in Revelation. Then he goes on and says, and the things will take place after these things. That is, starts in chapter 4. So we believe that rapture happens at chapter 4. Because now, Apostle John, who was on earth, now he is in heaven. The great tribulation starts when the seals that are given to the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be opened up, and that starts in chapter 6. So from chapter 6 until chapter 19 is what we believe is the Great Tribulation. So we believe that the rapture happens before those seven years start. Now that doesn't mean we are not going to see a lot of things that's going to lead to the Great Tribulation. These things have long tails. We may see a lot of things that are getting in place. If you see now all this stuff that's happening, it looks like that the chairs are being arranged on the deck, basically. So we believe that, that after the seven years of tribulation, there is going to be a thousand years millennium that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be ruling on this planet. So why does he need to rule on this planet? Because at the very beginning, in the, gospel, in the book of Genesis, God told Adam and Eve, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. He gave that command to a member of a human race. That has never happened. The earth has never been subdued by a member of a human race to the point that it is. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes, he, in that thousand years, he is going to be ruling, subduing everything. Then there is this idea of mid-tribulation, that some believe that, you know, the rapture happens in the middle, three and a half years into the tribulation. But it all depends how you would define the wrath of God. Remember that verse that I showed you, that he's going to save us from the wrath to come? So, if you think that the seven years of tribulation is the wrath of God, well, the promise is that we would be safe from that wrath. Rapture would happen before then. But if you don't think that the seven years entirely is the wrath of God, then you will define your theology where the rapture is going to happen. Well, there is a lot of problem with, hap with them not knowing why the rapture is taken in the middle of the tribulation. You see, because... If the wrath of God is going to come, it's not going to come upon the church because that's his promise. But what happens when you read, you read in chapter 6 that there are untold number of believers 
that are being martyred. Well, what is that? Isn't that the wrath of God? See, that theology doesn't hold. Then there is a post-tribulationism that says that the rapture happens at the end of tribulation, so the church will go through the tribulation, through the whole seven years, then the rapture happens, and then once the rapture happens, they are going to come back down. Some refer to it as a yo-yo rapture. You go up, and then you come down, right? And if that is not bad enough, there is somebody has said that the, there is this idea of pre-wrath rapture, that it happens three-quarter of a tribulation. Well, that's funny, because all of the rapture is supposed to be pre-wrath, right? It says he's going to save us from the wrath to come. So I don't know why they named it pre-wrath rapture, but it just, I guess, sounded good for selling books. So anyway, so that is the view of the rapture. Moving on, the Lord goes on, and he tells them, behold, I'm coming quickly. So this word quickly is just like we talked about. First of all, it says that when this event happens, it's going to happen very rapidly. When the Lord Jesus comes, the rapture, like we read in 1 Thessalonians, in a twinkling of an eye, in a twinkling of an eye, it's going to happen. Second coming doesn't happen in a twinkling of an eye. It has a whole long period of time to go through before the Lord comes back. He said, I'm coming quickly. But the quickly also has the meaning of imminency in it. I can come at any moment. So he tells them that, behold, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. So what is it that they were to hold fast? Well, he had told them to be faithful. They were to remain faithful until the Lord Jesus is going to come back. That is what he is telling us today. Also notice what 1 Corinthians 15 that he's talking about the rapture says. It says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Now notice here he says flesh and blood. You know, when the Lord Jesus Christ appeared, what did he tell his disciples? He said, Touch my body, see that the ghost doesn't have flesh and bones. He didn't say nothing about the blood, right? Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. The Lord Jesus Christ had a new resurrected body, just as we will have a new resurrected body. The life in that body is not the blood. The life in that body is the life of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I'll tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Usually they have that on the top of a nursery. Everybody goes there just to make the parents feel good. We all shall not sleep, but we're all going to be changed. Right? But anyway, he says that we shall not all be asleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. You know what a twinkling of an eye is? How fast that is? That is when light passes through the lens of your eye. How quick is that? How quick is that, right? In a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. You talk about this to the unbeliever, they laugh at you because it doesn't fit their paradigm. So their paradigms need to be changed. Now, if you lived at the time of Noah, what Noah said didn't fit their paradigm either. Right? They hadn't seen rain or flood. And they thought he's crazy that's building the ark. Some estimate that during the time of, uh, that at the time of Noah, that they were perhaps billions of people at that time. If you figure out that all these guys lived eight, nine hundred years and how many kids they could have had. Out of all those, eight people were saved, folks. Eight people. 
They probably thought that when God was going to judge Sodom and Gomorrah, that that's not going to happen either. In fact, that's what the Bible says. Lot's future son-in-law, they thought he's joking. They thought the old man has lost his mind. Until he was removed, which is a picture of the rapture, and then the destruction came upon them. And then the Lord says, he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. What does, he, what, what does that mean? He's going to make him a t- pillar. That means he's going to be a permanent fixture. So what is it that they are to overcome? They are to be faithful. They are to remain there. And he shall go out no more. I will write on him. Watch this. This is the Trinity. I will write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes then out of heaven from God, that's Holy Spirit, and I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. What an honor the Lord is giving to the one who is faithful to the end. The Lord is coming back soon. We don't know when, but he has bid us to remain and occupy until he comes back. What does it mean to occupy? You see, we are soldiers behind the enemy line. We are also soldiers on the front line. Everybody that becomes a believer never goes back because you are not going to lose your salvation. Never again. If you are here, you have put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he died for your sin, that he was buried and he rose again. You are a believer. You say, well, but that's too simple. Yes, it is, because it has nothing to do with what you and I do. That is a grace of God. Grace of God is a gift from him. And it is just a simple belief in him that saves us. So this whole way of salvation is a one-way salvation. Everybody that becomes a believer never goes back. Are they going to sin? Absolutely. We know that in our own lives. That's what all that sanctification is all about. That is why the Lord is encouraging us to be faithful. That is why the Lord is encouraging us to live out of the life that he has given us. However, nobody that comes out of the other side will ever go back to them. Right? So it is a one way. It is only the unbeliever that becomes a believer. A believer never becomes an unbeliever. So the Lord is building his church. It's adding to his church daily. And we will never lose our salvation. What a great gift that he has given us. So Peter says, if we have this gift, if we have been saved this, how shall we live? And that is the question for us, for the church of Jesus Christ. How shall we live? Let's pray. Eternal God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, God of mercy and compassion, Lord, we are just so blessed that you chose us even before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before you. For in love you have predestined us to adoption as son. And that, Father, we would behold your glory. For your desire was that we would be with you for all eternity. Thank you for this great salvation that you have given us. Help us, Lord, touch our hearts and minds that we would be faithful with regard to the things of our Father. Help us, Father, that as we encounter this age, 
this culture, this environment, Lord, that we will remain steadfast to the truth that you have taught us, that we will remain steadfast to who we are in the Lord Jesus Christ and live a life as a testimony to your faithfulness and greatness that we would exhibit a holiness in our life that comes through the heart. For your word says to be holy because you are holy. Now, if you are here and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, well, there is a day of judgment that's coming. Today is the day that if you hear him, don't turn your heart, believe on who he is, and receive the free gift of salvation that is only true in the Lord, true in the, of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.